Would you do me a favor in, in this room? Would you help me welcome those at Hillside Fontana that may be watching or watching online? We're so glad that, that you're with us. We're launching into a new series uh, this weekend, and, and I just want to start off with a couple of questions real quick. Um, has anyone made a Christmas wish list already? Anybody in here? Like, you, you've got some things on your wish list. Okay, so give me a couple of examples. If it's not yours, of maybe something your kids have put on their wish list. Give me some help, some examples. Baseball something, what? Slime kit. Okay, interesting. LOL calls. I am, oh, okay, sorry. I'm, I'm obviously not up to date with some of these things. Uh, what else? Oh, vacation, puppy. I, I heard last night almost simultaneously somebody back there said Corvette while somebody here said lotion. And I just all of a sudden decided I'm going to be adopted. Sorry, mom and dad. I'm now up for adoption by the family who asks for Corvettes for Christmas. Like, I guess you can ask for anything. It doesn't mean you're going to get it, right? Now, let me ask you another question. How many of you have a New Year's resolution already? All right. Like overachievers, that's who you are. Those of you who just raised your hand, you're an overachiever. But I want to say it makes a lot of sense, actually. Because what most of us do is we go through craziness of Christmas. Like we actually say things like this. It's a rat race. It's a marathon. But I love it. That's weird, right? And we go through Christmas and then we're tired and we've already spent more money than we thought we should have spent and we want to get into a new year and then, uh-oh, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I'm overspent, but now I need to come up with a resolution how not to do that again. It doesn't necessarily make sense So you overachievers. That makes a lot of sense. Another question. Have you ever prayed for something that you were supposed to get? Like, it's the kind of thing you expect, like, it's, it does, it's not really a selfish prayer, is it? I, I, I should just expect to get this. Like, maybe, like, I just need a job. I'm not trying to be selfish. I just need to live. And it doesn't feel like maybe God is answering like you hoped. Maybe you're praying for a child. God, I don't think it's selfish. I just want a child. Is it too much to expect to have a baby? Or maybe it's for a sick child. And you're like, children are supposed to be sick, God, so could you just heal my sick child? Maybe it's for a marriage. Maybe it's for a, a spouse. You're like, God, how long do I have to wait? I'm 24 years old. <laughs> I'm supposed to be married by now. And then people don't help. They're like, hey, when are you going to get married? You're 23 and a half. You're like, thanks a lot. This is really helping me in my life. The question that I want us to wrestle with today, or the issue I want us to wrestle with today is this idea of our expectations. And are they set on the right things and in the right places? Or do we need a little bit of an adjustment of our expectations? And if God were to do an adjustment of our expectations, maybe, just maybe, we could start experiencing what really matters, what matters most in life. If you have your Bibles, grab them, turn to Luke chapter 1. If you have a smartphone or tablet, Luke chapter 1 is where we're going to be. But I also want you to do something. Hold your place in Luke chapter 1 and turn just to the left a little bit to the very last book of the Old Testament, Malachi. And we're not going to be in Malachi long, so if you don't know how to find it, it's okay. We'll, we'll have it on the screen. Luke chapter 1 is what I really, really want you to, to be uh, if, you have, if you can do that. Malachi chapter Four. It's the last book. It's the last chapter. I want us to read the last verses of the entire Old Testament. So look at this. I mean, just think about it for a second. There's a lot of Old Testament. There's a lot of stuff that God was doing, God was saying, and we get, <coughs> excuse me, to the end, last book, last chapter, last verses, and this is what the prophet Malachi writes because God says it. Verse 5. See, God says, I, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. There's a warning with a promise embedded in it. As the Old Testament ends, there's a promise, and God basically says, I'm not finished yet. That's good news, right? I'm not through yet. My story isn't over. But the truth is that marks the end of a chapter of a long, long story of the work of God in history. Period. It ends. Period. Scholars tell us, and then there are 400 years of silence 
before the New Testament begins. 400 years where prophets didn't prophesy. Angels didn't make appearances. 400 years of waiting. It doesn't mean that God wasn't working. It doesn't mean that God wasn't still showing up. But there's a unique season of waiting for 400 years. And then the New Testament begins. Matthew, Luke specifically telling about the birth of Jesus. We're going to spend some time these next weeks talking about some of those stories that get all the attention. Mary and Joseph and shepherds and magi. But we're going to start with a character that is often overlooked but is so important. A man named Zachariah and his wife Elizabeth. And their son, John, who becomes John the Baptist. Luke chapter 1, I'll start reading in verse 5. And I think what we'll see is that even though sometimes God seems to be way too late, sometimes it seems like like our, 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 our life is frustrating us because we're not getting what we expect if we can have a shift in our expectations. Maybe, just maybe, we'll find real life. Verse 5. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous. I love that. Not just one of them. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. They were righteous. They were blameless. They observed God's ways in every way. I mean, that's a lot to be said, right, about one person, much less two people. Like, I wonder, did they ever even fight? Did they always get along perfectly because they're blameless? Like, wow, that's saying a lot. Verse 7, but they were childless. Because Elizabeth was not able to conceive. And they were both very old. See, on one hand, they have all these things going for them. They're they're righteous, they're blameless, they observe God's ways in every way, and they're walking in these ways that that are so profound, but they've got two massive problems, two big problems that radically affected their life. Number one, they're childless because Elizabeth was barren. I can't overemphasize in that day and age how severe that was. It was was almost as a curse. People would look at you almost like, I wonder what you really did. How did you mess up and God's punishing you? But we just heard God's not punishing them. They're righteous, they're blameless, and they observe God's ways all the way, right? It wasn't because of that. That's bad theology. She's barren. That that, that was one of those things that it is in this day that is heartbreaking. It's one of those things that you feel the sting every time somebody would say, hey, isn't it about time you guys start a family? And Zachariah's like, we're trying. But their second problem is they're old. And so probably somewhere along the way, people stopped asking, isn't it about time you start having a baby? Because I think probably people gave up on them and probably they gave up on themselves and maybe the disappointment turned into sorrow. Maybe the sorrow didn't stay there but it turned into a frustration. And Maybe the frustration didn't stay there but it, it almost became a hopelessness. I don't know if I can trust God for this anymore. I wondered had they already stopped praying about that years ago because they gave up. See, I don't, I don't know. I don't know the pain of childlessness and I can't imagine it. I know the pain of too many children that are little, but that's another story altogether. I, I, I know the pain of a sick child for a decade. And you know your unique pains and struggles and sufferings and those things that aren't supposed to be. But here's what we want to talk about for the next number of weeks. There are new starts, new seasons in life, fresh perspectives that, that in some ways can be The circumstances aren't over, but start here. Start again now. Let me give you an example of a start here kind of a moment. It's when you graduated. That's a start here moment. But you know what another start here moment can be? When you graduated and then you still can't find the job that you hoped you would get when you graduated, but you have a moment where things shift. There's a perspective shift. A start here moment can be you just had a baby, but guess what another start here moment can be? When someone you love dies. 
A start here moment can be you get a phone call of a clear diagnosis, but a start here moment can also be you just got the phone call, it's back. We have to start again. A start here moment can be you got married, and it's a start here moment, but guess what? A start here moment can also be you just got divorced. Life isn't over, but there's a new chapter starting now. The question is, how do we have perspective, adjust our expectations in the process of life? Zachariah and Elizabeth are childless and they're old. And it's easy to really have given up on this. But God's not given up on them. Verse 8. <coughs> Excuse me. Once when Zachariah's division was on duty, and he was serving as a priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. So real quick, let me try to set a context. In the temple, everybody would go for worship on these days. And, and, and Zechariah is a priest. Now, he's not a very well-known priest. In that time, in, in that area of Jerusalem, Judea, Jericho, there's probably 20,000 priests. So he's just one of a bunch of priests. And like the famous priests, the important priests, lived in important places like Jerusalem or uh, Jericho, but not not. Not Zechariah. He lived in the hill country of Judea, which means he was a hillbilly priest. Like he's a hillbilly priest. He talked with an accent and he wore flannel when he did his priestly duties. Like he's a hillbilly priest. Why are you laughing? I don't, even, I don't even know why you're laughing. He's a hillbilly priest. He's no name priest from a no name place and not a whole lot of important things going on. But on this day, when he goes to offer the temple services, there are lots that are cast. The first lot that is cast gets the priests who are going to go into the temple, and they're going to cleanse the altar and prepare the fire. So they cast a lot. They pick those priests. They go do that. They cast a second lot. On the second lot, this priest and his uh, associates cleanse the candlestick, offer the sacrifice, get the altar of incense ready. They cast a third lot, and that lot falls on one person, and that becomes a once-in-the-lifetime opportunity for somebody. You get to be the priest who burns incense. And I know you heard that, and you're like, oh, that's amazing. But back then, it was, oh, that's amazing. It was once in a lifetime. If you had that opportunity... You never got to have it again. It was a once-in-a-lifetime thing. And so the lot falls on Zechariah to be the pr priest who burns incense. He gets to pick two assistants, probably his friends, who have this high, holy honor with him. And as they begin to ascend the steps to the temple to burn incense, which, which represents the prayers of the people and the blessing of God, what, what we hear in this verse, all the assembled worshipers gathered outside, and here's what we know, silence fell over the whole temple ground. And the people outside, they, they did a couple things. They bowed down with their hands opened, and they waited. They waited. Because they thought God was getting ready to do something special. So Zechariah and his friends, they're ascending the steps of the temple. This hush falls over everything. They get to the place where Zechariah goes back a little further than his other two associates because he's the only one who can be in this place and burning this incense. And, and he's probably praying, and then he burns some incense. Then he's praying, and he's praying these prayers from the Psalms, these prayers of the priests of blessings over God's people. And he's closing his eyes and praying, then he's burning incense a little bit more, and look what happens. Verse 11, Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. Let me play this out for just a second. He's burning incense and then he's praying. He's burning incense and then he's praying. And he's praying. And he's praying and he opens his eyes. <laughs> he sees an angel, but he can't say anything. He's startled and he's gripped with fear. Maybe not the best reactions you would hope for in that moment, but he's startled and he's gripped with fear. Why? Well, because every time somebody encounters an angel in scripture, it's a holy moment. They're not seeing a baby with little wings like... They're seeing an angelic, holy creation of God who's a magnificent being. So he's startled and he's gripped with fear. It's a holy moment. He was not expecting this. He's startled and he's gripped with fear in verse 13. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, which I think I would respond, easy for you to say. <laughs> 
And he says, your prayer has been heard. Stop right there real quick. Your prayer has been heard. What prayer? What prayer has been heard? Like I think on one hand, Zechariah has been praying for the people. He's been praying these blessings that all the priests pray. And so maybe on one hand, the angel's saying, like, that prayer has been heard. I am going to bless. But then he gets really, really specific. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. I really believe with everything in me, he probably gave up praying that prayer a long time ago. He's old. He lost hope in that. Other people had given up on them. You're too old to have a family. So they would stopped praying that prayer. So I wonder, I wonder if the angel is saying, you remember that prayer you prayed 5, 10, 15 years ago? That's the prayer I'm talking about. That prayer, that place you gave up on God. You stopped expecting God to do something like that for you. That prayer has been heard too. It's never too late. You may have been waiting a long time. And listen, you may have been waiting a long time for God to do something. But I can promise you, you've never been waiting 400 years for God to do something. It's never too late for God. For us to expect him to do what he promised us he would do. We just need to make sure we're expecting him to do what he actually promised he would do. Your prayer has been heard. You're going to have a baby. That is an amazing moment. You're going to call him John. Those words from 400 years earlier are now seen in the description of who John is going to be. You can see it starting in verse 14, but I'll start reading in verse 17. And he, John, will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteousness to, listen to this, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Does that sound familiar? That's exactly how the Old Testament ended 400 years earlier. And God's first declaration after 400 years of silence is through an angel to say, I'm not finished. My story isn't over. Yeah, there was a long wait. Yeah, there was pain. Yeah, there may have been confusion. But I'm not finished yet. That's good news. I thought at least three people would say amen at that point, not just two. But that's okay. You're still warming up because it's only 1037 a.m. in the morning. I mean, maybe, go, maybe you should go get another cup of coffee. <laughs> it's good news. That's such good news. And the angel is declaring, you can trust me in this. Verse 18. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. So, okay, Mr. Angel, maybe I can help you for a minute. There are some things you don't understand. You don't understand, obviously, my circumstance. I'm an old man, and I know it's not kind to say, and it's not kind to speak of a woman's age, but my wife, <laughs> she's really old. She's really old. Angel, you, you got the wrong people. You got the wrong promise. That doesn't apply to us. And it's like, how can this be? But it's more like, what are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense. Now, these are the first words that we hear come from the lips of Zechariah, this priest. And let me just tell you, they're not, they're not the best response you could ever have when God wants to do something in your life. Side note, how do you think we even got these words like, Zechariah had to tell somebody, right? Like, that's one of the things I love about the Bible is in some of the most holy moments, in some of these most sacred moments, the Bible doesn't gloss over the messiness of human responses. It doesn't say, well, I was a perfect man, and the angel appeared to me, and I said, whatever you say, angel, I will follow you. He was startled and gripped with fear, and then he told an angel, you don't know what you're talking about. And then he wasn't ashamed to go and tell other people, yeah, I missed that moment. I didn't get that one right, but good news, with God, my, fa my failure was not fatal. God's gracious. He wasn't ready to start here. But God wanted to do some adjusting of his expectations. Confession for me. I, I wasn't really ready for this weekend. Like, like there, I, was, I was in one of those seasons where I'm like, I don't know if I really want to go talk about a fresh start. And I don't know that I really want to go talk about great expectations. And, and I knew we were going to sing songs like Joy to the World. And I'm like, I don't really feel joy. And my wife was sort of like, well, you got to go to church. You're the pastor. I'm just kidding. It didn't happen like that. But that's sort of how I felt. 
And so yesterday morning, I, I was just in one of those battles. Like, we've been in a tough season of life. We've been in a really hard season as a family. And, and it may sort of be a little bit more subtle and under the surface, but it's been hard. And I took a couple hours yesterday morning, and maybe I did what a lot of us do when we're not feeling it. And I knew we were going to sing these songs. I knew we were going to talk about this. So maybe you do this a lot. Um, but a lot of times, if, if I'm not feeling it, what I'll do is I'll sit down at the piano and have my guitar beside of me, and I'll just literally play through and sing all the songs. You do that, right? Oh, you don't do that? Oh, that's what I do. So like, I'm, I'm like, I know we're going to sing this song tomorrow that, that talks about my soul, my soul magnifies the Lord. He has done great things for me, but things don't feel very great right now. So what do I do? And sometimes I sit down at a piano or a guitar or I come to church and I sing joy to the world because I feel joy in my heart. And sometimes I sit down at a piano or pick up a guitar or come to church and I sing joy to the world, not because I feel it and want to express it, but because it's true and I need my heart to be shaped and formed by it. So yesterday morning, I was like, I'm going to sing until I sense it. I'm going to declare it until I feel it. I'm going to keep singing until my heart shifts in the right place. And I just want you to know, sometimes that's the right response. And sometimes what you need to know is when we're singing joy to the world in this place, we know others of you don't feel it, but we're singing it on your behalf because it's true, even though you're not experiencing it right now. And we're in it with you. We're in it together. And we need each other to sing in that moment. And so I sang and I declared because these things are true and I needed to remember them. And so do you. And so do you. And this excuse, I'm old and it's, it's too late and I'm hopeless, Zechariah. God's like, I haven't given up on you. I, I, I haven't forgotten my promises. I, I haven't abandoned you. Look at verse 19. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. That's pretty awesome because he's like not just any other angel. He's like the angel Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. It's good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day that this happens because you did not, what's the word? Believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. I love how the angel declares, listen, your, 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 your inability to believe, your inability to expect that I'm going to do great things, it's not going to stop me from doing great things, but for a moment, for a little while, you're not going to be able to fully enjoy the good things I'm going to do. And you're not going to be able to talk about it because guess what? Big mouth, you're going to be silent. <laughs> Listen up. Watch what I'm doing. Get ready. I, I think Zachariah had been going through the motions, even in the temple, even with this great opportunity, once in a lifetime opportunity to burn his. I, I think he was probably just going through the motions because that's what you did. And my hope and my prayer is that you wouldn't go through this season of life again just going through the motions. But maybe starting here, starting now, starting today, there would be a shift in our expectations for what really matters good news that matters and is good regardless of our circumstances and whether they're good or not is there is there any like uh, lady who is expecting or or you're a family you have someone in your family who's expecting right now would you just raise your hand Okay, so, so you know what I'm talking about. Here, here's what's interesting when I asked that question. I didn't ask you, what are you expecting? <laughs> like, I just asked you expecting, and for some reason you knew I meant you're pregnant, right? I want to talk about a gift for those who are expecting. Um, this is a long story, so I'll make it really, really quick. 14 years ago, the worst travel escapade and debacle of our family's uh, existence. Uh, we were leaving North Carolina to go to Iowa for Christmas. We were flying, and we were at the airport at like 7 o'clock in the morning, East Coast time. And uh, all, all of a sudden, we realized there's going to be delays. Now, here's what's going on. I have 
at that time, two girls who were under two years old, both in diapers, both figuring out my wife is probably three or four months pregnant in the middle of the worst season of, of morning sickness, and we decide to fly halfway across the country. We get to the airport at 7 o'clock, delay, 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 delay. 19 hours later, we're in Minneapolis, 19 hours later, when they tell us there are no flights going out of this place, not tomorrow on Christmas Eve, probably not the next day on Christmas, you may be stuck, there's a blizzard, and we're like, Oh, no, I just remembered. We're out of diapers. <laughs> In an airport where everything is shut down at 1230. At, like, oh, 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 this is not good. This is not good. You couldn't get to your bags because they're stuck out there. Everybody's already given up. And we're like, what do we do? And we experienced one of the greatest miracles of our entire life. As we were frantically searching all over the place, we got down to baggage claim and we're like, we're out of diapers. We got babies. They're crying. It's a mess in more ways than one. All kinds of stuff going on. And somebody finds the greatest gift I've ever received in my whole entire life. A box of opened diapers in baggage claim were available for us. And I was like, I have never been so thankful for diapers in my whole entire life than in this moment. And I don't know that there's ever been another moment in my life where I was like, diapers, yay! Now, some of you are. You go to like a baby shower and some, a mother's expectant and she's thinking, you know how much diapers cost? And you give her those box of 14,000 diapers and she's like, this is so great. I got diapers, thank you. Like if I start giving diapers away, I'm like, who wants one? Like these are great gifts. Who, who needs a diaper? You're like, I don't want a diaper. Because this is only a good gift for someone who is expectant and needs it. When we were desperate and needed diapers, this, this was a right on time, right the kind of need we want kind of gift. And we were so thankful. For the rest of our time, I want to talk about a gift that, that is being offered to us. But it only will be enjoyed by those who are expectant. And if our expectations are changed, this gift is being offered, it will change this season of our life. And if we're not expectant, you know what we'll say? I don't need that. It doesn't matter to me. But if we're expectant, it can make all the difference in our lives. Look at verse 21. So Zechariah and the angel have been having this conversation. You get to verse 21. There's still this group of hundreds, thousands, I don't know, of people who are gathered. And simply, uh, Luke writes, meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile, while the angel and Zechariah are having this interchange, meanwhile, remember this, the people. Meanwhile, the people were, what's the word? Waiting. Literally in the Greek, that means expecting. They were waiting. They were expectant. They, they longed for that moment when the priest walked out and declared uh, Numbers ch chapter 6, verse 24. The, the Lord bless you and, and guide you, cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious. They longed for the blessing that the priest was going to be. They were waiting. Zechariah had no expectation. They're filled with expectation, hands open with expectation. And they wondered why he stayed so long in the temple. They're like, this shouldn't take that long. What's going on? When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple. How do you think they realized that? Read the next verse. For he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. He walked out of the temple. They're waiting to receive, and he's like. And they're like, something just happened. What is going on here? They were waiting for a word from God. They were waiting that the, the priest would be that person who stands before God on behalf of the people and on the people on behalf of God. And, and they're like, we're, we're longing for this moment, this encounter, this experience. And Zechariah can't say a word. Can't say a word. He missed the moment. Like he failed in a moment. That, that's sort of what happened. But this is really important. Failure is not fatal. 
with a God who is gracious and ready to forgive. He, he's just like us. He missed it in a moment, but he did not miss out on the movement of God. He did not miss out on the story of God. He quickly came back to his senses. He quickly made himself available to God. Read the rest of Luke chapter 1, and especially the end part as you hear Zechariah, read Zechariah, this prophecy that he gives of his son John and of Jesus the Messiah who is to come. But look at verse 23. It simply says, it simply says, when his time of service was completed, he returned home. Like this is one of those foundational Bible passages to the Christmas story. And it's just very simple. He just finished his service like he was supposed to, and he went home. But he couldn't talk. <laughs> like, that had to be a little bit weird. He couldn't tell people what was going on. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion, just as God said. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Simple. No-name people from a no-name place who didn't have a whole lot to offer, and yet God's plans for them and his expectations and his hopes for them was to play that role he had created them to play obediently and simply. Here's, what, here's what's good, and here's what I want to challenge you with. Not just be a good moral person. He was blameless. He was righteous. They both were. They followed the Lord's ways all the way. Only problem is they didn't believe. They didn't trust. They didn't walk in expectation. They were good. They were faithful. They were righteous. They were obedient. But even that wasn't enough because God was saying, I want you to trust me. I want you to expect. I want you to believe I'm going to show up. And when I show up, things change. He's not just worried in behavior modification. He wants our, the belief and our faith to mark our lives. And Zachariah is important because if there is no Zachariah, if there's no Zachariah learning to grow in his faith, walk by faith, having his expectations shaped by God, then there's no John the Baptist. And if there's no John the Baptist, there's no forerunner making ready the way of the Lord. And if there's no forerunner of John the Baptist making ready the way of the Lord, guess what? Then not all of the promises from the Old Testament are fulfilled. But because there is a Zechariah, there is a John the Baptist. And every single promise that God gave through the prophets is fulfilled. And we can trust that God is faithful to complete his word. And even though he may have missed a moment, he didn't miss the movement of God. And there is this man and there is this wife and others may have wrote them off and say it's too late. But God is saying, I'm not finished with you yet. And there's this man, this family, this no-name hillbilly priest who reminds us God doesn't choose the famous or the, the wealthy or the talented. He chooses the obedient and the willing and the available who will expectantly wait and watch for him. And there is this man that 2,000 years later, a priest still points us to this idea. I'm not the star of the story, nor is my wife, nor is my son. His son, John the Baptist, is the one who says, I must decrease that he, Jesus, the star of the story, can increase and increase and increase. Because it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. But if there's no Zechariah, there's no John the Baptist, there's no fulfillment of the prophecies of who the Messiah is. So he matters so much. And the gifts of this season matter so much. So I want to talk about a gift that I think we can receive and a gift that we can give. First, a gift that we can receive. Is the present the gift? Of his presence. The present with a T is the gift of his presence with a C E. His presence with us. God Almighty with us. Jesus Christ Emmanuel with us. And just as the gift of diapers is only really fully enjoyed and received by somebody who's expecting a baby. The gift of God's presence is only fully received by someone who is expectant that God has shown up and will show up in our lives. That's why the angel says this is good news. This is really good news. You may be in a hard place. You may be in a tough spot. You may be losing hope. You may be doubting. This is good news no matter what. His presence. His presence. 
I, I, I have this little pet peeve, let me tell you about. Sometimes as people pray or sometimes as maybe even a song that we sing says something like this. It'll, it'll, sometimes people pray, God, we're just praying that you'll show up. God, we'll just pray that you'll be here. Can I just help you just a minute with that? Because this is a personal pet peeve. God is the sovereign creator, the almighty God, the omniscient. He knows it and the omnipresent. He is everywhere. You don't ever have to pray God show up because he is already there. And the question is not, is God going to show up? The question is, will we be aware and expectant of his presence that's always there everywhere we go? we got to make that little shift to say the problem is not with God, did he show up or not. The problem, the issue is with us. Are we aware that he is here? His presence with us. That's what this story of Christmas is all about, that he loves us so much. He sent his son on a rescue mission to be with us and for us. And what if starting here, starting today, we received the gift of his presence that he's with us, he's for us, he's not against us. And it changed the way we thought. It changed the things we expect for. It's not about presence with a T this year. Like there's nothing wrong with getting those kind of things. There's nothing wrong with asking for those kind of things. I would just hope and pray that like the people waiting at the temple, we would be more expectant and longing for an encounter with God in this season more than a present under a tree. And that would shape us and mark us, not just for the next few weeks, for the rest of our lives. Mark us. Second gift, that's the gift we receive, but here's the gift we can give. The gift that we can receive is the gift of his presence with us, empowering and overflowing. The gift that we can give is the gift of our presence with others. Your kids don't need something else from you, they need you. Your family doesn't need another laundry list of things that, that you can give them. They need you. Your, your, your Christmas party this year does not need your world-famous pie. They need you. Because some of us get focused on the pie or the gift, and we're so exhausted in finding it or making it, we show up and we're like, you better appreciate it after all I've done for you. We don't even show up. So as we encounter God, we receive the gift of his presence, then we're at a place where we can offer our presence in God full of expectation and hope for others. So that everywhere we go and in everything that we do in this season, this is interesting, a little crazy for some of you, we're like little priests all the time. A priest is a person who goes to God on behalf of others and others on behalf of God. We can live our lives as priests. That's kingdom of priests. That's biblical. Priesthood of all believers. That's believer. That's biblical. Google it. As little priests in the world, everywhere we go on, for God on behalf of others and to others on behalf of God. Our presence matters. Your presence matters. Show up. Be there. You're not in a classroom on accident. You're not at that job and at that desk on accident. You don't live in that place on accident. You didn't go to that store on accident. You're there for a reason. And here's what's crazy. We literally, we literally are surrounded by the declarations of God's praise. And if we're not careful, we can miss it. You can be in your favorite shopping store looking for that one thing that you've got to find. And the praises of fall on your knees. Oh, hear the angel voices. And you can miss it because you're not present. You're looking for a gift. And every moment in this season is packed full of the potential of the presence of God, if we're aware. My wife went shopping, I think it was last week or the week before, and she was gone for like two and a half hours. And my first response was like, typical. I'm joking, I'm joking. I was like, I don't know where she is. She went to one store. It shouldn't take this long. So she comes home, and I'm like, where were you? You were gone like two and a half hours. And she's like, I was at one store. I'm like, okay, I can't, I can't fathom this, because if I'm in any one store two and a half minutes, like, that's too long. I'm a get in buy it and leave if I have to. Two and a half hours. Can you explain it to me? And she was like, I was there two and a half hours, but I think I shopped for 20 minutes. 
I'm like, I really don't understand what you're talking about now. Please help me. She's like, I was in a conversation with this young lady in the store. And I would shop for about two minutes, and then we started a conversation, and we'd talk for 30 minutes. And then I would leave and shop for two minutes, and we'd find each other, and we would talk for 30, 45 more minutes. God was in that place. God was meeting. Like, God had always been in that place, but he revealed himself when she just spoke some words and showed up. Don't ever underestimate the power of God in every moment of our lives. Ten years ago, we were in the hospital with our daughter. Uh, we, we, we understood what the treatment was going to look like, and we understood there is no way we're getting out of this hospital room by Christmas Day. We're going to be in the hospital for Christmas. And a lot of other kids around us are going to be in the hospital for Christmas. Um, because our other kids were young in that season, and the hospital doesn't allow young kids for sickness protocols in the winter season to come in. We knew our daughter wouldn't see her siblings at Christmas time. We weren't going anywhere for Christmas. So my wife had an idea. What if we bring Christmas to where we are, to the sick kids? T this will be the 10th year that we've done what we've called Kate's Crazy Cool Christmas, trying to bring hope and a smile for kids and families who are going through some of the most devastating things. Listen, we cannot change their circumstances, but we can impact their expectations. You can't change the circumstances of most of the things in your life, and you can't change the circumstances for most of the things in other people's lives around you, but you have a role to show up, and you can help form your own expectations as you encounter God, and you can show up on behalf of others and help change their expectations. And Somebody does see, somebody does hear, somebody does care, somebody does love, somebody is willing to sacrifice their own presence for the sake of presence showing up in my life and that matters don't waste this season don't waste this time don't be so self-absorbed or so stuck to a Christmas wish list of stuff and miss what really matters start here start now make some decisions today that aren't like the decisions that some of us are going to make. Some of us are going to make decisions in the next three weeks that we regret for the next two months. I wish I wouldn't have spent that much money. How am I going to pay off that credit card? Don't do it. I'm so busy. I'm so tired. I'm ending this year, and I'm so glad it's over. What if you start right here? Christmas isn't the end of the year. It's the new beginning of a new chapter, of a new story that God is inviting us into. And we would say, God, I want that gift of your presence to change my life, and I want the gift of my presence to be offered to others who need me to show up. We pray with me. God, we thank you that you have shown up for us. We thank you that you have been faithful for us. We thank you that where Zachariah shows us it's, it's never too late, and even in our failure, our failure is not fatal, that our hopes could be renewed, our expectations could be reset, and we could experience you fully. Thank you for this time of the year, Jesus, that you came for us. Thank you for your love, God. Thank you for your faithfulness. Now, we want to receive that gift of your presence, to know that you're near, to, to sense you, to experience you. And we then want to be present in the lives of others. To make the most of every opportunity in this season of our lives. So starting here, starting today, would you lead us and show us your way. In Jesus' name, amen.